mountains and I rise up I rise like the day I rise up I rise unafraid and I rise up and I'll do it a thousand times again and I rise up I like the waves I rise up in spite of the ache and I rise up and I'll do it a thousand times again For you For you For you For you When the silence is unquiet and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe And you feel like dying But I promise we'll bring the world to its feet And move mountains Bring it to its feet And move mountains And now rise up like the day I rise up, I rise unafraid and I rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. And I'll do it a thousand times again And we'll rise up I like the waves We'll rise up In spite of the ache And we'll rise up And we'll do it a thousand times again For you Many thanks to Karishma Patel for setting our evening off to such a lovely start. Beautiful song. Um, my name is Neville Hodgkinson. I've um, been chair of the Janke Foundation for some years, and but that role has just been taken over by Sarah Eager, who usually plays the part of emceeing this annual lecture. And it's just as well, actually, that this year it's me rather than her, because I learned tonight that she was... Actually, when she was training as a psychiatrist many years back, Dinesh Bugra, our guest speaker, the, uh, the distinguished professor of psychiatry, was her supervisor. And I think that might have constrained her <laughs> as, uh, if in seeing this. She might not have been able to be as tough as might need to be. But um, seriously, the... Um, the, the Janke Foundation has uh, just been celebrating 20 years of its work, and um, the, main, the main purpose when it was set up was to provide 
a regular flow of funds to a new hospital on Mount Abu in a poor area of Rajasthan. And it's done that to the tune of a good chunk of money every year in these 20 years. And it's thanks to the contributions of many, um, but um, the, the, the inspiration also uh, that had come from Daddy Janki was that the charity, which had to be set up as a specific charity to fund the hospital, that rather than do fundraising in a conventional way by going out asking for funds from um, august bodies and this kind of thing, but instead that it should actually serve the healthcare professions and healthcare in general. And it's done that with a focus on values in healthcare, a wonderful project that went into many, many countries and is still inspiring healthcare workers in many countries with publications that have helped patients come through difficult times and with uh, patient education leaflets and many events where people have taken an inspiration to understand health and illness from a deeper perspective than is sometimes shared, especially now we've actually changed our name to the Janky Foundation for Spirituality and Healthcare. That's very much our focus. So it's a terrific pleasure to me to welcome our guest lecturer tonight. The annual, the annual lecture is quite a highlight for the, the foundation. And Professor Dinesh Bugra, he's just recently stood down from a three-year term of office as president of the World Psychiatric Service, uh, World Psychiatric Association, and he's held very high office throughout his career in many different fields, but I learned tonight that he's president-elect of the British Medical Association, which is a wonderful honour. And I learned, I've, it's the first time I've met him, but I think Sarah was extraordinarily lucky to have him as supervisor, because apart from, apart from obviously knowing his stuff, um, he's very charming and uh, very, very uh, humorous. So this was a great pleasure to meet him, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy the presentation tonight. Our topic, as you may know, is cultural identity and depression, a help or hindrance. And the, the idea is to look at this subject of um, de the very, very widespread illness of depression, and are there cultural influences on the way we understand it? Are there cultural influences making us more prone to it sometimes? And sometimes we may be more protected by our cultural circumstances against depression. And so um, Professor Dinesh has um, a huge amount of experience in this field. I, he, was, he was telling us that um, you were on the BBC just the other day. Um, they called him about the programme, the, the boy, the boy with the top knot. About uh, it was a, a on TV just recently, and uh, discussions around it. The boy's father had uh, schizophrenia, but it hadn't been acknowledged and understood. And so he was pulled in on that because he's such an expert in in this field, especially relating to um, cultural factors. Um, a couple of things just to say. A welcome to all of you. Lovely to see such a, a big audience tonight with many new faces. A welcome to those on the webcast. I heard that it's already a few dozen listening on the webcast and um, we're a bit slow connecting so it'll probably increase further. One thing to mention that photographs and film are being taken of the event so if anybody would prefer not to appear in any photo or uh, film record of it please just let the the uh, let one of the ushers know. Um, and um, the th our theme of cultural identity and depression, it's going to be uh, um, a presentation. The lecture is uh, from uh, Dinesh, and then he'll be joined in conversation on this subject by Sister Genty, who will give a 10-minute response to what she has heard, uh, drawing on her huge experience as the she's a very long-standing sister with the Brahma Kumaris, and she's the European Regional Director of the Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual University, and very much in demand all over the world, both for her, her wisdom and for the beautiful vibration uh, and meditations that she shares. So then, after that response from Sister Genti, they'll be in conversation for a while, and then may maybe, uh, we'll see how it goes, but there might be time for a few questions towards the end. So that's the pattern of the evening. Very warm welcome to all of you, and especially to Professor Bugra. Um, 
I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you very much for that very warm introduction. The fact that I'm here is partly due to Sarah, but it's also um, one of the things that I've, over the years, I've been very impressed by the work that Brahma Kumaris do, uh, not only here, but also in India and elsewhere. And it is one of the things that, as a psychiatrist, really gets me going is how do we see the patient as a whole? One of the major challenges for when we talk about depression in particular is that there are many languages around the world where there's no word for depression. And historically, the word depression emerged only when the um, human body was seen as a machine. And that meant that you had some pressure on you and things slowed down. Until then it was called melancholia and there were different kinds of melancholia and people used that. And personally, I think there is something to be said for uh, that term. What I'm going to sort of do over the next uh, half an hour maximum is give you an illustration of how symptoms of depression appear how different cultures respond in different ways and how people seek help. And it's a fairly clear, and I'll keep coming back to some of the research that I did in South Hall many, many years ago with Punjabi women in particular, that people do, uh, do recognize certain symptoms. Low mood, very common. One of the tragedies of using the term depression is that depression is a symptom. It's a feeling and it's a clinical diagnosis. And that's what sort of confuses things further because you know, we all get out of bed the wrong side and you have a really horrid day and you at the end of the day you sort of really don't want to go out, you don't want to do anything, you just want to you know, go under the duvet and sleep. Now, is that clinical depression? Of course not. So is the persistence of the uh, low mood. It's about this quality of unhappiness. We all feel unhappy, some more than others. And part of it is uh, reactive, part of it is situational. Um, and for me, I mean, one of the major diagnostic criteria for depression is about this diurnal variation, that some people feel good in the morning, others feel uh, good in the evening, and we all know our body clock. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm generally up at about 20 to 6, no matter where in the world I am. Um, my body doesn't believe in uh, jet lag. And for the first hour or so, I don't want to see anyone, I don't want to talk to anyone. I want my own space to come to so that I can face the day. And I'm sure each one of us in this room has similar kind of experiences that you know, some people are really energetic in the morning. Morning is the best time for them. For others, it's the evening. So this diurnal rhythm becomes incredibly important. And of course, then there are physical symptoms of uh, poor appetite, not being able to sleep, uh, losing weight. Some people sleep too much, um, either feeling very agitated or feeling very retarded. Um, one of the major factors is this loss of pleasure. Not only that I cannot enjoy anything when I'm feeling depressed, I cannot ev even express good feelings. I cannot express happy feelings. It's lack of energy, feeling worthless, feeling useless. And the other notion about guilt and shame is quite an important one, and I'll come back to that, because in many cultures, if you're feeling depressed, it's about shame. And in others, it's about guilt. And, you know, I have let people down, or I've let myself down, or I'm ashamed because I'm feeling like that. And <clears throat> poor concentration, and very often, the suicidal intent uh, which 
makes people feel life is not worth living, so I might as well be dead. Sometimes it's passive, sometimes people do uh, active measures. And there is obviously, you know, diurnal variation and irritability. You may gain appetite, you may gain uh, weight and anxiety. And we know when we talk about culture, what do we mean by it? It's sort of, you know, um, you get a Petri dish and you grow bacteria or fungus or something. That's also culture. It comes from a medium. Our cultures come from the, where we are born. It was purely accident of birth that I was born in North India, of Indian parentage. So I have a kind of, I mean, Indian culture is too broad a term. It's more about Punjabi culture. The way I think, the way I look at the world, uh, my rituals, um, the shared meanings. And if you take nothing else away from this evening, I want you to bear in mind um, this notion that cultures are dynamic. And it is quite interesting that, uh, you know, every time I go back to India and I go back about sort of every two months, India has changed. And I resent the fact that it has changed without me. <laughs> um, and then I have to change and I get into this what I call my Indian mode of thinking. It takes me 10 days. Until then, if things don't start on time, I'm sort of really getting very restless and agitated. After I've been there for 10 days, <laughs> it could be a day late, couldn't care less. Um, so the point is that cultures change, we change with culture, and in turn, we also change culture and culture changes us. So it's a very uh, dynamic uh, dialogue. We know, uh, you know, as I said earlier, that depression is about a symptom, it's about a syndrome, it's about meaning, and it's the context. And there are certain variations across cultures. I'm going to give you a general picture before I go into the specific examples. Judeo-Christian cultures are much more to do with guilt. Partly it's about egocentric cultures uh, compared to more sociocentric or collectivist cultures. When I go back to India, I'm not Dinesh Bhugra. <clears throat> I'm grandson of so-and-so belong to that family, that village, that kinship. And no matter what I achieve, whether I'm president of BMA or World Medical Association, counts for nothing. It's my sort of, you know, family lineage, which is uh, important. So under those circumstances, my view of who I am changes. And who I am then will determine whether I feel guilty or I feel ashamed. When we talk about self-esteem, what do we mean by that? That again depends upon how you define self. If myself is embedded in my kinship, then anything I do is going to affect the kinship and therefore myself becomes very different. So when people talk about deliberate self-harm, and particularly some of the work that I did in, again in South Hall in uh, the 90s was about the rates of self-harm among Asian women were about three times those of uh, white women the same age. What was it that was different? Apart from the fact that you know, there was a degree of culture conflict, there was a degree of uh, family violence, alcoholism, etc. But it was also that who, when I'm taking an overdose, who am I harming? Which self? Is it my collective self or is it my egocentric self? And that also means that, you know, how do we condemn ourselves? Uh, Self-esteem, self-image, um, self-condemnation. And it's also, it'll become clearer um, that in many cultures, when you're feeling depressed, uh, you present with physical symptoms. Um, simply because, as far as you're concerned, mind and body are connected. 
It's the Western medicine where uh, there is a mind-body dualism that somehow mind is there, body is there, and they don't talk to each other. And that's the problem in healthcare in this country, that you've got psychiatric hospitals somewhere else, you've got physical healthcare somewhere else, and they don't communicate at all. It's also about suicidal thoughts and suicidal rates, and they vary across cultures for a number of reasons, and if we have time, I'll come back to that. I think this is quite a sort of interesting slide that three to four percent of general population will develop depression in their lifetime. One in five will seek treatment, one in 50 will enter hospital, one in 200 uh, commit suicide. Um, women are twice more likely to develop depression compared to men. And it's also worth remembering that very often women are the carers. So they get a double whammy. And it is for bipolar disorders, uh, it's a sort of gender distribution is equal. Now this was one of the first studies which looked at depression across the world. Well, they chose five sites, say, let's pretend it was all the world. Um, Baal or Basel, Montreal, Nagasaki, Tehran, and Tokyo, say Japan, Iran, Canada, and Switzerland. Complicated slide, but I don't want you to sort of worry about it. Just look at the first column. If we look at sadness, sadness, joylessness, hopelessness, anxiety, tension, lack of energy, social function, loss of interest, common in Baal and in Montreal, but then symptoms start to shift and change uh, in other countries. And this is where the difference comes in. In Baal, it was about people who were depressed had a different perception of time. The time was much slower. Um, in Montreal, the common problem was change in body weight. In Nagasaki, it was about aggression and irritability. And in Tehran, it was about delusions of guilt, hypochondriasis, and uh, feeling um, impoverished. And in the same country, there was a clear difference between Tokyo and Nagasaki, that in Tokyo, there were delusions, which is unshakable belief that I am poor, uh, without any evidence. Whereas in um, Nagasaki, it was about aggression and irritability. So again, um, we don't know, but they did the same study in Ghana. And again, sadness, joylessness, hopelessness, anxiety, lack of energy, lack of self-confidence uh, were um, common. Interestingly, in China, and this is quite a sort of interesting study that um, Arthur Kleinman, who's an anthropologist and a psychiatrist, did he, in China, uh, they use um, a diagnostic category called neurasthenia, which means weak nerves. And it's a very common diagnosis, but he decided uh, for 100 consecutive patients to give them Western diagnosis, American diagnosis, uh, diagnostic system. And using the American diagnostic system, he found that out of the 100, 93 had clinical depression, 87 had major depressive disorder, and in 60% of cases, it had been going on for uh, more than two years. 44% had chronic pain, of which there were sort of seven com physical, seven complaints of which m the kind of five were physical somatic complaints. And out of, out of those 93, only nine complained of depression. Okay? So far, so good. But when you ask them what is wrong with you, 78% felt that there was something physically wrong. And he then decided that, uh, you know, put them 87 on antidepressants. Uh, after six weeks, 
65% had improved substantially and 70, 17% slightly, but in 30% cases, social impairment had got worse. Why should that be? You know, your mood is better, you're feeling better, and yet your social functioning is worse. So when he went back and asked them and looked at it again, it became very clear that having the diagnosis of neurasthenia gave them a certain cachet. Socially, it was okay to be rude to your mother-in-law. I've got neurasthenia. I can't go to work because I've got neurasthenia. But if somebody tells me I've got depression, it doesn't have the same value in the Chinese culture. And that is something that we need to be thinking about both clinically and otherwise. So this was a piece of work that I did in North India looking at 75 consecutive um, cases of uh, depression. And as you'll see that 98% men had low mood, 100% of women, and loss of interest was sort of fairly high. And then uh, guilt was reported in about sort of 60% of women and 53% of men. But if you looked at uh, physical symptoms, 35% of men complained of sinking heart, 52% of women complained of sinking heart, 50% of women had headaches, 18% had dizziness and agitation. So if we now move to uh, the UK, and there have been a series of studies, and the weekly prevalence of depressive neurosis is um, among men about 2.7%, women again nearly twice. Um, Indian men about the same, Indian women, for some reason, lower. I don't know what your secret is, but I'd love to know. Um, and similarly, uh, Pakistani and uh, Pakistani men have higher rates and women have lower rates. And Bangladeshi men have lower rates as do uh, women. And perhaps we can have a sort of conversation uh, later on. This is an interesting study, but um, Asian men, although they were less likely to rate their own health good, uh, but also less likely to have long-standing illness, but more than twice repeat consultations with GPs, but for men, not for women. Um, again, um, Asians had the highest rate of consultation. This is in general practice. And immigrants had the lowest rates of consultation for mental disorders. Um, similarly, they sort of consulted for upper respiratory tract infection and um, wanted to, um, you know, leave the surgery with prescription, uh, certificate or follow-up appointment. And I think I'm going to sort of skip that. This was an interesting study uh, funded by Campaign for Racial Equality, uh, old study, 16 women who were depressed, all of Asian origin. Um, and detailed interviews showed that the symptoms were about weakness, feeling physically weak, uh, phys feeling listless, uh, tearful, unable to sleep, unable to cope, uh, poor self-confidence and loss of meaning of life and contemplation of suicide. Hardly any of them used the word depression. And most were probably not aware of the term. And part of this under detection in primary care is that there are varying explanatory models. And I'll come back to that because that's quite a sort of interesting finding. And using somatic physical symptoms, my heart is sinking. Um, <clears throat> feeling hot, feeling gas. In Nigeria, it's about heat in the head, biting sensation all over the body. I'm in China, as I said earlier, it's about neurasthenia. Mexican Americans in the USA, uh, nervous, brain ache, my brain is exploding, or uncontrollable. In Dubai, some of the work that we did was my chest feels tight, I'm tired and fatigued, I have a broken body. Um, 
And similarly, in UAE, it's with the hub. Heart is poisoning me as if there's hot water over my back. Something is blocking my throat. And again, those symptoms that I've already sort of touched upon. We then, in South Hall, did a series of focus groups with Punjabi women to try and understand. We gave them a sort of short story about a 23-year-old female who's taken to her bed, is not interested in anything. Uh, what do you think is wrong with her? And surprise, surprise, everybody recognized the symptoms. Everybody recognized the um, causes which were to do with you know, domestic violence, alcoholism, um, etc. What would you do? Um, the single response was, um, what's to do? Depression is part of life's ups and downs. So we'd rather go to the temple or the mosque or the gurudwara um, than go to see the GP, because if you go to see the GP, it'll become known that uh, I'm on uh, medication. Nobody would come and visit me. Nobody would marry into the family. Uh, and that's where the sort of boy with the top knot comes in. Uh, but what it taught us was that as clinicians, we are focusing on the wrong places. We expect our patients to come to us rather than us going to the, where the patients are. And again, there are some sort of wonderful examples of uh, good practice from around the world, and we, if we have time, we'll talk about it. But we know that depression is caused by uh, the sense of entrapment, learned helplessness. I can't do anything about this. And that's what sort of cognitive behavior therapy challenges, uh, those negative thoughts. Entrapment is that I'm really trapped, I have no control. And the other difference in many cultures is the explanation of depression. Um, I must have done something horrible in my previous birth. Or my neighbor has cast an evil eye. Supranatural, natural explanations, it's not physical, it's not psychological, it's certainly not social. In other cultures, it'll be psychological rather than uh, somatic. So we need to uh, be aware of what terms people use. So it's also about, particularly for migrants, or uh, most people, that you know, we all have certain aspirations. And you know, 40 years ago, when I first arrived in this country, I had never, ever in my wildest dreams imagined um, where I would be. I had never thought that, you know, in sort of June next year, I'll be taking over the presidency of the BMA. Now, if I had come with that thought and I hadn't achieved that, there's only one president once a year. So my aspiration and achievement would have really pulled me down. And that, we did a piece of work looking at, you know, areas like education, housing, employment, social status, financial well-being. So when you assess depression, it's about assessing sadness, it's assessing joylessness, it's about how hopeless, helpless uh, the individual feels. And of course, there are then physical symptoms to do with uh, loss of weight, loss of appetite, uh, poor libido, uh, etc. Um, and of course, there are, again, cultural differences, as I've already shown you. But we need to focus on cultural identity. Who am I? And the simplest way to do it is ask the person sitting in front of you. In those days when you know, we used to hunt for pen pals by advertising and we'd say, you know, describe yourself and say, I'm looking for. I'm sure there are websites. Uh, are there? <coughs> I'm sure there are websites where you sort of, you know, uh, describe who you are. And that's a good way of understanding what my concept of my self is. And how do we then uh, change that? And of course, for a lot of people who are moving across cultures, and you may not have moved across cultures, there is a whole generation in this country who've been left behind 
by the IT revolution. And that sense of defeat, entrapment, and not knowing what to do, where to, to go, that sort of sense of shock. And that's also sort of part of this whole acculturation process. So these were the, I kind of already touched upon it, that Punjabi women would talk about weight on my heart, excessive thinking leading to pressure on the brain, poor concentration, forgetfulness, tiredness, sadness, feeling of heat. And the notions of heat and hot and cold are very common in Indian psyche. So any medicine you prescribe, the first question the patient will say, uh, is it hot or is it cold? And then they will want to know whether they should take it with hot liquid or cold liquid to counter its effect. And those are very clearly defined Ayurvedic models. And as clinicians, you know, we have to sort of respect those. And we did an, another interesting study again in South Hall. Um, 100 consecutive Asian women attending a GP surgery. We did various uh, assessments. And surprise, surprise, the GPs picked up only 17% of women who had depression. They missed 83%. That wasn't a surprise to us. And you know, generally people say, oh well, you know, we should teach the GPs to recognize it better. We decided we will educate the patients to get them to use certain trigger words to the GP to see whether the GP picks them up or not. And it is uh, really interesting that when we did that, the recognition by the GP went up from 17% to 31%. Normally when you say to a GP that you have to do this, this, then and they, you know, I haven't got the time to, so, so part of the challenge really is um, every person in this room is an expert. Mental health is too important to be left to experts. Every person needs to look after her own mental health, and I'll come back to that. We did a number of focus groups looking at depression and suicide. Again, in Asian community leaders, uh, 10 focus groups uh, looking potentially at solutions. And these were the key problems. And it was a complete surprise to us that dowry in this country was seen as one of the top four problems causing depression and suicidal ideation among Asian women. And of course I can understand in-law problems and marital family conflict and isolation. Uh, violence by the husband feeling trapped in the family and uh, depression. Longer they had been in this country, more conflict, surprise, surprise. And younger age related to feeling trapped and higher education uh, related to marital problems and again that's a discrepancy between achievement. I've got my PhD from, oh, I don't know, pick up a university, but I haven't got a job, or I'm working as a machinist, or my husband still expects me to come home and do the cooking and you know, uh, do the washing and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so we then created educational pamphlets and um, distributed 300, and we had 182 returned, and we then followed up, contacted all 180, uh, four to six weeks later by a telephone interview, looking at um, the impact of the pamphlet and information. And again, uh, it was not a surprise that the number of people who said that they could now recognize depression had gone up, and they also knew where to seek help. And it's not only the general practitioner and the other sources. Um, and again, uh, we did something similar in Dubai, and I've given you the findings earlier, but it, what we did was we asked community leaders to put down all the terms that they could think which describe depression. And we showed these terms to mental health professionals and said, right, of these 180 terms, 
which terms you think are most sensitive for a diagnosis of depression. And something like 70 terms came up. And we then used that. And again, uh, the number uh, were very, very, very uh, physical symptoms, somatic symptoms, uh, pressure on head, heat in the body, etc. So I think just to kind of draw this to a close, um, there's absolutely no doubt. I mean, for a very long time, um, Western psychiatrists used to think that, you know, happy, clappy natives uh, did not suffer from depression because they were sort of, you know, really wonderful, exotic creatures. Um, it's wrong. Just because uh, we do not have words for depression in the same way that depression itself is a new term only about sort of 100, 150 years old. Um, we need to look out for depression. The meaning and symptoms vary from neurasthenia in China to my heart is sinking in Punjab to I feel gutted or I have butterflies in my stomach in the UK. It's, they're describing the same experience they're describing the same sense of tension, agitation, feeling low. Um, difference between guilt and shame. Uh, differences in physical symptoms. And again, one of the things that we need to be thinking about is that when we look at cognitive behavior therapy, one size does not fit all. We need to be very clear if, you know, the cognitive behavior therapy kind of, the triad says, um, I feel horrible, my future is bleak, or I have no future. But surely that depends upon how I define I. Who am I? Am I an egocentric individual who doesn't want to do anything with anyone else? Or am I part of this sort of collectivist society within which I may be so, uh, sociocentric or I may be egocentric? Doesn't matter. But how does that sort of fit in um, with that? So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for being here. Be very happy to take questions, comments. Um, any rotten tomatoes, please keep them to yourselves. We'll, uh, we can prepare some nice curry afterwards. Thank you. Well, thanks to Professor Bugra for a really wonderful review of this subject. And I think what has come across to me most strongly already, I can understand why he has been given such high office by his profession in a variety of ways over the years and with, with this uh, BMA presidency coming up because in very practical ways he's improved the care of probably thousands of people through the research, through helping, to, helping doctors to understand patients better and helping patients sometimes too to understand what they might be able to do for themselves. So that's been really quite wonderful. Thank you. And uh, now we're, I'd like to invite the chairs to come up because we've got this next step, please, where we're all going to be up on the stage. Uh, Sister Genti is going to speak. And uh, in response to Professor Bogra's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bogra. I found that very interesting, and yes, um, how can you not agree with the results of research? And what I found fascinating was the different terms that people use, um, and how the word depression doesn't actually come within their vocabulary until fairly later on through consciousness raising, awareness raising, and so on. And I wonder whether one of the things that happens in India also has made a big difference in terms of how they live in the UK, in terms of immigrants. And where I know that when I was a child, 
we moved to England when I was eight, but um, in my home, we lived with my grandparents and a great-grandmother and many cousins and relatives all around us, very close. And we came here and it was a very tiny nuclear family. And I'm sure that if my mother hadn't been a meditator, we arrived in December in the cold and it was a very um, powerful winter, lots of snow. Today I would love it, but at that time I didn't understand it. Um, so arriving here, not at, during the Christmas festivities, but afterwards, but I'm sure my mother would have got depressed. But yet, I think it was her meditation that kept her going and so on. So that switch from a big joint family mm -hmm. to a very tiny nuclear family, I'm sure that makes a huge, huge difference. And that whole situation of neighborhoods. Um, we were living in Hampstead in a flat, and I don't think we knew any of the people in the other flats for a long, long time. Maybe it was in the summer when people started coming out of their caves that we began to see them and acknowledge them and recognize them. So the conditions were very, very different from home and here. So I think that that creates a situation that maybe people don't label it that way, but does definitely lead to depression. So I can see that culture in that sense is a major difference. I can also see where um, you mentioned it at some point in terms of the way people think. And of course, it's universal, it's global. It's not one country or one culture, but where the conditions of the world have become so stressful generally, um, that it creates a lot of negativity. And the negative thoughts that one can have about oneself in a society that's very, very competitive, um, definitely that can be on the one side, it can lead to depression, but on the other side, I see how spirituality can become a big factor in helping people there. Um, you mentioned how the word depression only came about in recent times. Well, again, I think the word stress only came about in applying it to the human condition only around the time of after the Second World War, I think, not around then. Um, before that, it had never been applied to human minds. It was applicable to metal, not human beings. So I'm seeing that stress, depression, very associated, of course, and coming in from the time that some of us, for, my, for our own lifetime, you remember the conditions even, say, 50 years ago, and today there's a very big difference in the conditions now. So, how to deal with it all? Mm. And yes, I know that psychiatry has its own methods, and I'm very, very grateful that Sarah has been a very good friend of mine, and whenever within people I know who need help, she's always been available and put us in touch with the right places where people can be given help. So I'm totally aware of the work of professionals and the need for that, but I think that generally speaking, um, meditation and being aware of my own inner identity and learning to come to terms with that and what it is I can do and what it is I am capable of, all of that can be very, very helpful for people. So my interest is, yes, identity in terms of the inner being and where sometimes culture has um, really been a hindrance. I mentioned some of the good signs of Indian culture, for example, but um, I was hearing about the story of the boy with a top knot and where cultural identity refuses to acknowledge mental ill health and wants to camouflage it with another name. And it's seen as something which is not right. 
Whereas in fact, if there's an illness, you won't ever say that it's not right for me to have an illness, but when it's mental health, then people come up with different notions of why it's happened, and you mentioned some of those things. Um, I see that in these cases, it's very important to come to the identity of the self rather than just be um, hindered by the cultural barriers that exist. So these are some of the thoughts that came up as I was hearing you. Thank you. I mean, I think uh, you brought home um, sort of several things to me. I mean, I arrived on 30th of November. Uh, my flight landed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I come out of Heathrow and it's pitch dark. <laughs> Where have I landed? It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And you then sort of said, how do people stay awake till 11 o'clock at night? <laughs> and when I started my first job, you kind of, you know, talk to friends, oh, let's meet for dinner. And, you know, this friend sort of looked at her diary and said, oh, um, yeah, how does sort of, you know, 30th of March sound? <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't used to it. You know, in, in India, normally you sort of, you know, you want to visit somebody, you just go. You don't even ring and say, I'm coming. And if they're not there, you do something else, and then you come home. And it kind of, the, and now, I mean, I've kind of, you know, 40 years later, I have the doorbell goes and I'm not expecting anyone to say, who is this? Why are they ringing my doorbell? And those kind of things also are important in terms of micro-identities. Who am I? You know, here at this particular point, I'm a lecturer and you're the audience and you're listening to me. I'm male, I think. Um, I'm a Hindu. But I can hide my Hinduism, but I can't hide my malehood in that sense, unless I'm... Um, <laughs> Grayson Gray Perry or Eddie Izzard. But the, the point really is that part of the acculturation process is that we learn to hide bits of ourselves, partly in order to be accepted, partly it's the process of acculturation, and partly it is about um, creating social capital. And I think it's the social capital which becomes very important. And part of the spirituality um, functions are about that social capital. That, you know, we all come together and we pray or we kind of share things. And that gives me a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of um, being, uh, which allows me to then deal with all the sort of horrible thoughts that I might be having and I can you know, hide them partly as part of my micro-identity and partly as a human being because you know, there are other things going on. And I think you also sort of said something quite um, important which is about the whole notion of acculturation and how do we come to terms with changing cultures. And you know, India is not the same India that I left 40 years ago. I said culture in transition. And there are things about it which utterly shock me, things which amuse me. Um, things, you know, I've been there, done it, bought the video, got the t-shirt, you know, let's do something different. So part of the human nature is that adjustment and how do we um, adjust and how do we avoid feeling trapped. And I think that's where sort of spirituality uh, plays a major role in sort of getting us out of that entrapment. Absolutely. Um, even in just terms of identity and male and female, and you were quite humorous in what you said, but um, that trap of being a woman yeah. and the cultural imposition that's put on women, certainly within Asian culture, but generally in the world. Um, it was only spirituality that allowed me to come out of that, because otherwise I think I would have been waving a flag as a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I was just at that point, 
at that crossroads in which I could, my life could have taken many different directions, but then coming across spirituality in a very deep way, meaningful way, and I realized that any barrier that I had, I had imposed on myself, yeah. and I could go beyond those barriers just through the understanding of my own inner mm. identity, rather than the identity of just the body. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Mm. That's a very interesting point, because it, it, it brings us to, back to this, um, uh, the duality that you were mentioning of the, sort of, I forget exactly how you put it, but the egocentric self and the collective self. And broadly you're saying, you know, the Asian and Eastern model is more collective, mm. and the Western European model is more egocentric. And um, I'm, I'm aware of how, um, in many ways, I sort of rejected my family background. I kept connection, but, and I loved my parents, but, but even so, you know, I was part of a generation where we were getting new opportunities in education and that sort of thing, and went off on a, a wave with other like-minded young people. And it meant that we could leave some of those collectives, mm -hmm. but it also le left us a bit high and dry. So I'm aware of how the collective can be supportive, and in the absence of that support, the ego can become very demanding. Mm. You know, the, it, but is there something of that kind going on here? I think it's also, I mean, <coughs> fair to say that not all collectivist bits are good either, because there is a kind of family expectation. If you're particularly an egocentric individual in a socio-centric society, you're in trouble. Right, <laughs> yes. Um, so there, there are those kind of culture conflict and tensions. But I think you, you raise a very important point about um, the transition from sort of collectivist self to egocentric self. And there have been a considerable amount of research which shows that egocentric societies have higher rates of um, mental disorders, higher rates of divorce, higher rates of crime. Um, now, <coughs> who knows? I mean, I think it's one of those things you always find what you're looking for mm -hmm. and you ignore what you find uh, because you were not looking for it. <laughs> but it, it also, to my mind, it sort of reflects that there is something in this notion of social capital, whether it is, you know, a modern family in the sense of, you know, people are onto their third marriage and children from, you know, four different relationships and how does that sort of meet and what happens to those children or whether it is simply that you know nuclear family husband wife 2.2 children and immediate parents and that's it or that social capital is about sort of spirituality and you know belonging to a group where you have common values mm. yeah. and, you know how much that sort of protects us from uh, things like depression and anxiety and agitation. Yes, I, I can relate to that because I, I can sense that I think um, I had a rather needy ego and uh, perhaps connected with this particular life journey. And um, then when I came into the Brahma Kumaris, uh, I think I was a bit of an example of uh, an egocentric individual coming into the collective and you said you're in trouble when that happens. <laughs> So either you sink or swim, you know. Yeah. And um, but coming into this family has def definitely gave me a, a structure whereby some of those rough edges of the ego were being, mm. you know, that that sense that you've just got to kind of push for yourself, sort of thing. Yeah. Some of that got taken away, and um, more that sense of family grew through this. Mm. Uh, but I'm I'm not at all clear on. Um, on whether East or West have the better of it. Perhaps, there are, perhaps it swings and roundabouts, is it? I think, I mean, it, it is, a, again, um, the two are very different things. I mean, it, it's quite interesting that in India in the last five to ten years, people are beginning to talk about depression mm -hmm. um, related to stress, uh, and they're talking about counselling, which they never did before. Mm -hmm. It's also 
quite interesting that in at a sort of bigger level, as the country is becoming richer, it's also becoming more religious. And there's a sort of very cognitive dissonance paradox here that, oh, yes. you know, which mm. is very difficult to explain. It's with the rise of a more fundamental approach to religion, is it? I mean, I think even if we keep fundamentalism to one side, mm -hmm. it's that people are becoming more religious in terms of rituals and so on and so right, forth. Right, right. Uh, but not spirituality. Mm -hmm. mm. So th there's a kind of shift. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, in this country, for example, you know, the um, traditional view used to be that, you know, Sunday was your um, church day. Yeah. You know, the whole family went dressed up, went to the church, listened to the sermon. Then you came home and the family had a, you know, joint meal. Um, and that's the number of people going to church has dropped. But, uh, you know, so th that means the kind of the whole idea of social capital is changing. Very much so, yes. In, in England and a lot of yeah. Europe now. But you're saying that in, in India, there's an in, along with this huge uh, improvement in living standards for, for millions, there's an increase in, in religious practice. Yes. That it's is an interesting. interesting difference, isn't it? <laughs> it's yeah. interesting because um, I usually spend about three months of the year in India, <coughs> and it's not just in Mount Tabu, but it involves a fair amount of travel around. Um, and what I'm finding is that certainly young people and people who are now in their second, third jobs, that sort of age group, 30s and 40s, they seem to have moved away from religion in a very big way because they're very, very disillusioned. They haven't found answers, they haven't found mm. logic, they haven't found reason. And so there seems to be actually a big rejection. And then, yes, you've got the fundamentalist rise. That's a very strong movement. Mm. But generally speaking, within the people I'm connecting with, um, they're interested in the sort of spiritual ideas presented in a sort of very basic psychological way like the awakening program that we ourselves have. Um, but I don't find that there's more religion as such. So maybe it's a difference between North India and the rest of India. I, I, mean, I, I certainly find that, um, you know, maybe the people I mix with are much more religious than they used to be. Mm -hmm. And the, the, um, the popularity of the current government would indicate that, wouldn't it? Because it's definitely less of a, it's a more religion-based uh, government than the previous one, the Congress I, Party. I, I think that, that there's a kind of global shift in terms of sort of nationalism and fundamentalism and increased religiosity. Mm. I think people are feeling disillusioned with uh, globalization and the impact is that the rich have got richer and poorer have got poorer. Yes. So what do you do? You're trying to find answers. And it's like, you know, people, um, mm. I mean, I saw it in myself that, um, you know, my family are not sort of overtly religious, but, you know, you'd have sort of religious rituals and I grew up with those. When I went to medical school, you kind of, you know, would a scientist and you sort of moved away from it. And when I finished medical school, you sort of think, science doesn't have the answers. So you need to find a balance between mm. spirituality and science mm. to say, you know, how do I sort of map them mm -hmm. to make sense of some of the answers? That's also so interesting in the context of Brexit. You know, that it, it's, it's got that nationalistic flavour to it. Mm. It's not racist, I don't think, but it, it might bring the danger of an increase in racism. But I don't think it was racist-based. I think it was more this sense that somehow those liberal left ideals of a globalised world mm. uh, weren't working for too many people. And the, the open door uh, immigration that was actually pr proving a challenge to, to some working people's livelihoods. So in a very practical sense, I can see how th that might be a little bit of a parallel with what you're speaking of, of the rise in, in reassertion of a religious identity mm. in India. 
and, in, and of course in America too, yeah. with the Trump phenomenon. They're very interesting. Um, you'd mentioned something about the sense of belonging, and um, I think that that's something that people are really looking for. Mm. And so whether it's culture, whether it's religion, whether it's a political ideal, mm. um, but where you do need something to ground you and be um, a community, part of a community and belong. Mm. I think that's very much a human need. Mm. And where there isn't that being fulfilled, that can also be a factor mm. for very severe loneliness, leading maybe even to yeah. depression. Mm. So if that is a strong uh, need that is coming through at the moment, um, I can see that the Brexit kind of mentality, the Trump phenomenon, increased nationalism in different parts of the world, um, the, that need for a, 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 a more identifiable family that you're belonging to, this is sort of pushing through in a number of ways. Could that actually get in the way of, of a higher sense of belonging? You know, of, of, of our belonging as a human family. Uh, is it like, in a sense, a failure of the spiritual understandings to be giving people what they need? <laughs> yes, I do think that, that um, where you have that spiritual awareness of your identity and you belong to that larger community of people who share higher values, ideals, and so on, and you recognize that it's not part of one country or one race or religion, it's another level, then that can truly bring an inner contentment and satisfaction that isn't available from belonging to a group here and there and wherever, definitely. Um, do, do you sense, um, Professor Bougara, any um, increased recognition in our society broadly, and maybe in the professions, for the role of spirituality in, in uh, taking care of ourselves in the ways we're talking about, and, uh, and avoiding these, these, uh, this neediness that can show itself up uh, as depressive illness? I think it's certainly there has been a shift over the last 30 years from sort of, you know, saying, you know, psychiatry has nothing to do with spirituality or religion. There's been uh, gradual recognition and a lot of work has been done. And, you know, Sarah and her group in the Royal College have uh, done a tremendous amount of work on sort of bringing the two sides together. And I think for me, I mean, the challenge really is that when you see the patient who's the individual in front of you, you have to see where he or she is coming from. Mm. The kind of immediate factors which are to do with family, uh, which are to do with kinship, which are to do with, um, you know, social capital and mm. to do with, you know, peer group. And then sort of larger issues to do with broader culture, broader um, society and um, employers and a whole host of other factors. So it is, I think part of the tragedy uh, of medicine as a whole has been that we've been focusing on diseased organs, <laughs> not on people. And we forget that, uh, you know, people are people and you know the organs who make people mm -hmm. and you know there's no point fixing up a broken hip if the person can't walk and if the person has to walk for their job or uh, for their livelihood then that should be the outcome not that you know kind of x-ray shows perfect fracture screws are in place plate is in place <laughs> You know, mm. and similarly in psychiatry, that you know, we need to say, so okay, you know, there's a diagnosis of depression, okay, but what impact is it having on individuals' functioning? Yeah, that's what I picked up from your presentation actually, that a lot of your research had been helping your colleagues to make that connection. 
to the, the individual and, and their social functioning. That's quite something. Because I, mean, I think if you ask patients what do they want, they're not going to sort of say, I want medication. Mm -hmm. They say that, you know, I want to get back to my job, I want to look after my family, I want to, mm. you know, have reasonable amount of money, reasonable number of friends, etc. So, you know, the strength of spirituality and its advantage is bringing those kind of social functioning back into focus. Mm. And certainly over the last 20 years or so, I would say that there has been a sort of slow but perceptible move towards that. Mm. Maybe I'm being optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, we're, we're getting some wonderful insights into this subject. Would, is there anyone would, in the audience who would like to ask something of Professor or Sister Genty? Yes. Uh, two gentlemen with the glasses, eh? Yes. Uh, professor, <coughs> in your uh, talk, you either by design or default avoided mentioning anything about religion, the positives or the negative effects of it. Um, <clears throat> however, in the discussion, we have uh, uh, addressed the help, uh, addressed the helpful side of spirituality <laughs> and religious belief, which the individual who is suffering from depression uses to overcome um, they sort of daily problems and, and, and so on. But in society, religion, in fact, has a very negative impact because many religions seem to view an illness of the brain as the wrath of God. And that causes isolation, stigma, etc. And I think many people don't recognize that, that Many religious people, in fact, seem to totally think it's it's not something to be to mm -hmm. touch with. I mean, I, I've, I've, I do a lot of volunteering with people with uh, mental illness, <clears throat> and in the past, whenever I've gone to certain places of religious worship to ask for assistance. In, in sometimes I've been told, well, we don't want a whole lot of mad people coming over here. What, what is your view on that one in you omitting religion in yeah. that? Three, three things. One is that if you read Gita, Gita is the first ever cognitive behavior therapy manual. <laughs> <laughs> if you read Ramayan, there's a very strong family history in the Surya Vanshis. In the end, Lord Ram commits suicide. You don't know the kind of reason I rationale. But the third point for me, which is one of the most important ones, is how do we work with religious healers? And let me give you an example. In Gujarat, there is a dargah where a Muslim saint is buried. People with mental illness go and pray there. Gujarat government spent two years working with religious healers to set up a clinic. So there is a psychiatrist, a nurse, and a pharmacist. So now when you go to the Darga, nobody knows whether you're going to pray or you're going to see the psychiatrist. <laughs> psychiatrist sees you, recommends medication, pharmacist issues the prescription, pharmacist doesn't give it to you. Pharmacist goes and gives it to the religious healer who then brings it to the patient and says, this has been blessed by the Baba. <laughs> <laughs> Compliance is 100%. <laughs> because it sort of fits in with the patient's explanatory model. So the point that I'm making is that we need to find ways of educating. And again, I was talking to Nora earlier. I did some work with Obia men in Trinidad. And Obia men that I interviewed were very clear that what kind of conditions they would deal with. They will not touch addiction. They will not touch anybody with schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, social phobia. They, they had a... So, again, the part of our job as professionals is to work with religious healers. And we did some work in South London working with black church leaders 
uh, because you know schizophrenia among black Caribbeans is really, really uh, significant. And you can work, but it takes time. I mean, like the Gujarat government took two years. So it's not going to happen overnight. And we can do that. And we just need to think outside the box. Dinesh was again demonstrating his huge, the huge practicality of the approach and the immediate patient benefits. Uh, but I, it was a great question, and I'd like to ask Sister Genti to respond as well, because I know that um, even though the Brahma Kumari's um, meditation practice is theistic, you know, it can it includes this sense of drawing power from a from a, a higher being. Um, but you would generally say that it is not a religion or that it's, a sp it's spiritual rather than religious. Um, we have people coming from all religious traditions and people who come from no religious tradition or no aspect of faith in a sense. And so this is why I wouldn't put Brahma Kumaris in one religion in that sense. Mm. But um, what we do deal with is the spiritual dimension, understanding the identity of the self, the spirit, the inner being, being able to understand how the mind functions and how it works. And so I think this is where there's this overlap. Mm. Um, and so from a spiritual perspective, you can understand how to be able to discipline the mind and how to channel the energy of the mind in a specific way. And so that's essentially what we're teaching here. So it's, I think, something that people who are experiencing stress find very, very helpful. Mm. Um, I would never ever say that we offer professional advice for mental mm. ill health. I would refer them to professionals. But what we will do is, of course, offer um, an understanding of what's going on inside your own inner world and where there's so much confusion today um, and that confusion of course can lead to depression or where there's so much um, negative feelings that people experience and you try and suppress them or try and control them and that can lead to depression too I know and so how do I deal with all of that? So spirituality gives us a way forward with this. And I'd like, to, I'd like to quote you, actually, again, this is some, an answer to the gentleman's question, where he spoke of how religion sometimes can be so, um, you know, punishment, guilt-inducing, etc., etc., and how that may be the last thing that the person needs. Mm -hmm. But um, Sister Genti, I remember some years back, stuck in my mind, she said, guilt has no place on the path of transformation. I love that. The gentleman in the blue jumper was going to ask something. Thank you. Um, sorry, part of my question was... Uh, thanks. Uh, part of my question was basically what I asked already about religion. And the second... That's such an important question. <laughs> it was, yes. The, sec the second aspect was um, you, you talked about medicine and how it's uh, relatively ineffective in dealing with uh, mental health issues in tackling. No, I didn't say you said, that. As in when you are, you can't explain everything, you're looking at the organs, you're not looking at the person as a whole, the holistic approach. Um, but then when it comes to mental health issues, medicine will never be able to do that on its own. You need society to do that. Because as an individual, you live in the society, you need the support of the society. So medicine plus society, is that the approach forward for...? I mean, do you mean sort of discipline of medicine or do you mean medication? The discipline of medicine. I think discipline of medicine has to work with the society. There's absolutely no doubt about it. One of the things that uh, medicine as a profession has lost um, is the role as an advocate. Um, medicine, I mean, there, there was a sort of... Uh, Burchow, I think, did a wonderful quotation um, which goes something like... Um, so either sort of politics is medicine or medicine is politics. So one of the two, so it basically means that 
we have two roles as clinicians. One as an expert, as a doctor, as a psychiatrist, as a pediatrician, gynecologist, whatever. But we also have a role as a member of the society. And part of the challenge in some of the work that we did uh, about 10 years ago was sort of, what's the medicine's contract with society? What is it society expects from us and what do we expect from society in return? And I think that's, it's an implicit contract, it's not explicit. But we need to, sort of, as society changes, and you know, we don't even understand the impact of social media on people's lives, on people's brains, on people's functioning. So we need to cre ha have that ongoing dialogue that, you know, you could be sitting at home on your Skype and I could be in my clinic and we could have a consultation. But then there are issues about privacy and confidentiality. How do I know that you're there by yourself? How do I know that you're not recording it and you're not going to sort of challenge me? So I think part of the responsibility as clinicians is as experts, but also as members of the society that we need to advocate for our patients. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question, there's a gentleman in the middle at the back there. There's some um, people in that corner also. There was someone in the corner, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, okay. And then we must, we must leave it at that, I'm afraid, because we ask you to lead us in a meditation. Um, good evening. Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, anthropocentrism, do uh, you understand what that is? <coughs> Sorry, say that again. Anthropocentric. Protocentric, okay. Anthropocentric An people. Anthropocentric, okay. What does that mean? Human being centric? Correct. So, and we've just recently lost a case in the Houses of Parliament where animals were to be considered as sentient beings. Um, that lost by a few votes. And I think that's very significant. Now that we're entering the age of robots, where people will have less value, just like animals have had less value to us. That's evolved over the last couple of hundred years. So animals were seen as not being valued <clears throat> as they were in previous societies. I think that relates to some of the issues that we have today, that we're treating animals as factory farm. They're no longer um, any more than a, a, a sack of hormones in a, in a box. But my question to you really is about how psychiatry has become based on the drug industry and why does it have to depend on the drug industry for its value? I think that's a mistake. Um, we know that placebos have great efficacy com in comparison to drugs which have a lot of side effects. But my third question and last one is what do you think about the suicide rates of young men which is now topping the charts as it were in terms of um, other diseases, psychiatric. Taking your third question first, because my short-term memory is kind of, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> too, too much detail. Um, there was a, a panel discussion in South Bank Center over the weekend. There was a sort of three-day festival, Being a Man. And I participated in a panel discussion on precisely on suicide among young men. And there are, challenges, again, it's a global issue. In the UK, men are uh, twice more likely than women to kill themselves, uh, whereas uh, in other countries like Poland and Hungary and Sri Lanka, they are eight times more likely. Only uh, three or four countries where rates between men and women are equal are China, Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Now, there is also a challenge about the figures, how figures are collect collected and who collects them and whether 
act of suicide is legal or illegal. So setting that to one, one side, what's fairly clear that there are socio-cultural factors which play a much bigger role. And certainly rates among men in this country have gone up since 2008, particularly as a result of the economic depression. Uh, I told you I've forgotten the first two questions. <laughs> uh, the first question was about robots and uh, what that would mean in psychiatry. Second question was about pharmaceutical companies and uh, the role. Uh, I think medication and um, pharma is only one bit in our armamentarium. It's not that all psychiatrists are in the pockets of um, um, pharmaceutical companies, we are not. There is increasing amount of work uh, being done on psychopharmacogenomics, which means that depending upon gene maps, uh, it can be decided what dosage you need, uh, what dosage will cause side effects, which side effects are going to be acceptable, and which side effects are not going to be acceptable. So I think that will, uh, in some ways, make a much more person-focused, patient-focused interventions possible rather than one size fits all. Your point, point about placebo is well taken. And again, we were discussing earlier that in some cultures, people like capsules. In others, they like injections. Some like syrups. Some like big pills. Some like very small pills. Some like red pills. Some like green pills. Some like blue pills. And no drug trial ever takes those kind of factors into account. That is what we learn from clinical experience, and we need to bear that in mind. And your first point about sort of the role as you know, robots come into play, what that would do to people's mental state and so on and so forth, and that's precisely the point about the people who've been left behind as a result of IT revolution are more likely to be left behind and unless the politicians and we as members of the society take that into account to work with them, we're going to be in serious trouble. There was one gentleman who had his hand up in the middle. We, we should come back to that, but um, if you could keep it very quick. Uh, thank you. But that doesn't mean that I'll give a short answer. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very good. No, we should short. feel um, relaxed about this. I'm a general practitioner, um, and what I've found, besides what you mentioned about isolation, housing problems, culture difficulties when people come from abroad, particularly immigrants, is a big challenge. I'll also agree with the, the previous gentleman who said about overuse of antidepressants in general practice. And it, of course, it starts for the hospital practice. And there's so much use because the problem is there is not enough facilities for the patients to be referred immediately to, to those things. Things, of course, have changed, and the doctors want to give something as an immediate treatment to the patient. The other thing which I wanted to point out is we have found that Iranians, Irish community, and Sikh community, Punjabis, they have problems with thyroxin deficiency, mixed edema, uh, is very common. And it is, we have found a lot of patients get depressed because of the lack of thyroxin. Mm -hmm. And in Asians, and we are vegetarians, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, and iron deficiency are not uncommon as which can cause depression in many mm -hmm. patients. Thank you. Thanks very much. I mean, I think your point is well taken, particularly in terms of um, Asian community with high rates of uh, diabetes and hypertension. Uh, depression also sent settles in, and if we don't treat both, uh, there is a problem. Then the hypertension and diabetes don't come under control because the depression is somehow uh, stopping that. But it's also, I think, the point that you make about communication, the best engagement with the patient is when uh, you may disagree with what their model is as long as you acknowledge. Uh, can I give a very quick example? <clears throat> Please. I was looking after an individual who had schizophrenia, responded to a particular medication. 
Um, I get a phone call from uh, the father saying, I want to come and see you. We're fine. We arranged in a time, came to see me and said, uh, you know, you keep saying that he's got schizophrenia and he's on this medication. We think he's possessed. What do you think? And I sort of said, you know, I understand where you're coming from and, you know, if that's how you feel, that's fine by me. And uh, he said, you know, we'd like to have him exercised. So fine by me, as long as you don't stop his medication. We were not thinking of doing that. And then comes the killer question, uh, do you know any exorcists? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Um, so I referred him to the hospital chaplain and said, it's between the two of you, you decide. I don't want to know what happens. And to be fair, whatever happened, the family remained engaged, patient remained engaged. He was on last heard, he was on medication, he'd got married, had two children. For me, that's a success. Yes. Exorcism or not. Mm. You know, so I think it is how do we kind of find a common ground? Uh, sometimes patients are looking simply for approval. <coughs> and we have to be open minded to sort of say that, yeah. Thank you um, to both of our speakers. Um, it's been a tremendous evening. And um, I, I think I'm now going to ask Sister Genti to lead us in a short meditation. Um, maybe, maybe I can connect it to the way that the evening has gone, especially because picking up on something that um, Professor Bugra said earlier, that every, as well as the professionals doing, making their contribution, every patient has to be an expert on his own self. And to take that self-responsibility is something that definitely I know that spirituality helps with. And um, also, I, just, I don't know um, if I'm stepping outside the boundaries of what I ought to here, but I love a quote from Rumi in this area <coughs> that went along the lines of, live your, live your life in a way that makes sense to you not to them. <laughs> no. That's very egocentric. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> it's true. That's probably why it appeals. <laughs> the Brahma Kumaris haven't done a full job on me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to you both. <laughs> Probably the best way is to have both feet on the ground and well grounded. And I'll share a few thoughts and invite you to follow those ideas. I reflect on the things I've been hearing about and watch what's going on in my mind. And I realize that I have a choice. I can let my mind go into avenues of negativity. Things are difficult. So many challenges come our way every day. We meet difficult people every day. But is that what I want to dwell on? Let me explore a different path. Let me turn my attention to the original beauty of the self. I deeply resonate with that awareness that every soul has goodness Every soul, in its original pure state, is filled with beauty, truth, and love. And for a few minutes, this is what I wish to explore. I allow myself connect with that inner beauty in which I, the soul, 
truly reflect the qualities of the Creator. I was created as the image of the Divine. Peace, compassion, truth belong to the soul. Deep down within myself, I know that these exist. And as I journey inwards, this is what I connect to. Becoming aware of who I truly am restores my value, my confidence in myself. Without ego, but with true dignity, keeping in my awareness my own original qualities, I come back to the awareness of the moment here and now and the things I need to do here but now connected with the inner being and the beauty and truth of this Thank you. So it has been a, a wonderful evening and um, thank you for your attention and for the excellent questions. Thanks to Professor Bulger for being with us. Really a huge, huge enjoyment in um, uh, your <coughs> wisdom, but also the, the, the fun that you gave us. And to Sister Genti, her sweet summaries and clarification on some of the, the deeper aspects of the inner, inner being. Um, if, um, if anybody would like to... Um, both of them are going to be available um, if you wish to say hello at the end of the session, which is, I just, I mean, we're, we're there really. I just have a few announcements to make. Um, nearly a hundred uh, extra people were with us online, and so thank you very much to those who you've been, who've been listening and been with us in that way. And a big thank you to all those who helped to make the program happened, happen, including the Brahma Kumaris itself for hosting the event and all the departments here in Global House and the Janky Foundation team who put a lot of work in in making something like this run so smoothly, especially Bhavna, Viraj, Preeti and Kalpna Tabani. Janky Foundation literature, thank you, is, uh, uh, is um, it's actually on the display table outside the hall as you leave. Please feel free to take a, a um, beautiful uh, free brochure about what the, the foundation does and copies of these books are also available but they're not free they, um, but they're really good Lifting Your Spirits both of them have a CD with um, reflective commentaries that, that help either in promoting your well-being or in lifting your spirits 
after a, an episode of ill health or during an episode of ill health. So they're terrific for us. Um, you can also visit our website for more information. And if you're not already on our mailing list about events and things happening, please, uh, you, can, you can join the mailing list by going onto the website, which is jankyfoundation.org. Have I got that right? Yep. Uh, www.jankyfoundation.org. Yep. And um, in relation to tonight's topic, uh, these two books are probably particularly helpful. And they're, they're on display, but you can buy them downstairs in the bookshop, which is on your way out. So um, we've also got booklets supporting healing and well-being, which you can take as a gift from the information table at the back. All our activities are free and uh, organized by volunteers, but um, donations are welcome, and it's those donations that help to make the, the charities support for the, the global hospital in India um, so effective. It's been, we heard at the AGM earlier that for the past 20 years it's been spending, it's been sending very substantial amount each year to support the global hospital which serves a very poor area. Um, the bookshop in the re reception of the main uh, building is open and there are many books and CDs on meditation by Sister Genti there. Uh, so you might like to take a look at those and have a browse. There are other authors also there on Raja Yoga meditation. Um, leaflets about activities in Global House are available at the back and in the reception as you leave. And um, finally, it's the custom of this house to share a sweet, it's called a toli, made with love, and also a gift marking at the foundation's 20 years of service. So please accept those at the doors as you leave. Make sure you get that, a little sweet, and um, the gift. And um, finally, for, to close the evening, I'd like to ask Sarah, who's the new, newly elected chair of the foundation, to read a poem, and she will say what it is. Thank you, Neville, and thank you, Dinesh and Denti, for your contributions. So um, the poem I'd like to share just to close is um, by John O'Donoghue, which I'm sure some of you know. And um, I think the Irish or Celtic way of saying it is banacht, which is blessing. Deidre will tell me if I'm right or bad. <laughs> banacht. So... On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the grey window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colours, indigo, red, green and azure blue, come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays on the sailboat of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of the light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. A beautiful evening generally. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.